All right, I'm here with John Aston. John, good to see you again. Sam, great to see you too. Thank you. Yeah, we've actually talked once before, and um, it was a great conversation for me. Um, well, for one, we kind of had this mutual background that we're both psychologists who are really interested in the nature of experience. Um, so I guess there was a, a kind of bond there <laughs> right away. But uh, also, I just, in the course of the conversation, I just got the impression that we are kind of like really uh, speaking the same language or um, just, just the way you express the nature of experience just really resonates with me. And maybe if I can just sum up, you know, how like what your approach kind of left with me, if, if I could say like three basic things that that really kind of stuck with me is that um, for one, our experience or the way it seems to be is not how it actually is, right? So in the fundamental sense, we're kind of, well, we, we tend to overlook the essential reality of our experience and that even though we have these, these concrete terms and we kind of seem to experience objects, that if we actually come up to these objects, see what they're at this experientially, we just find that they are completely open-ended and undefinable. But nevertheless, we can at the same time sense that there is something common about all experiences, which you also call the common denominator of all experience. And, and that, even though we can't, again, define what it is, we can't grasp what it is, that is um, freedom in of itself, in a sense. So maybe you just want to respond to that first, if that kind of like um, yeah aligns with with how you see mm -hmm. your approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That that it seems from one perspective that and and language and conceptualizing seems to sort of support this sense we have that we know what things are, right? That I know I'm having a conversation, right? I can define that in some sense. And I know that I'm having the conversation on a computer. And so that's also part of my, my, my frame of reference, say, of this particular moment. And, and yet, I can also explore what this experience is that I'm describing as a conversation over a computer. And that whole way of rendering it conceptually and linguistically turns out to be just barely scratching the surface of what's actually happening experientially, which is we could say it's 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 infinite, you know, what's occurring. It's infinite in terms of the quantity, <laughs> the quantity of phenomena that are actually occurring that I, I could never, if I actually just looked, if I just look and see and feel the quantity of 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 apparent phenomena occurring, it's impossible to tell a narrative about that. It's really impossible. It's sort of like, um, I've been thinking about this lately, how if, if you look at something that you would call a pattern, it's a bit like you're connecting the dots, you know, to see what the pattern is, right? Like, like you might connect the dots of a, of a constellation in the sky that looks a certain way and then we can name it because it has a kind of a pattern that resembles what an animal or something the different uh stellar constellations or the big dipper right so you're connecting the dots the lights in the sky and that, that then shows up as a pattern but if you haven't what's basically an infinite number of dots if you will <laughs> right now right oh my god how how can I connect an infinite amount of dots and what possible pattern could an infinite number of dots um, be? Well, th it's just, it's in that sense, it's absolutely transcends all the patterns, all the seeming patterns, our actual experience, our lived experience. Um, and yet it most definitely shows up as, as what we would call patterns, recognizable patterns, nameable patterns. This is a kind of paradox of, of experience that, it really seems to be something and shows up and appears as something and is in a sense experienced in some way as being something recognizable and describable and resolvable as being that and then being able to distinguish that from this and this from that and uh, this is the sort of ordinary kind of way of of 
that we seem to be perceiving the world and yet from another vantage it's like it's just so remarkable that our our experience can't be collapsed won't really be collapsed in any kind of definitive way into any of the frames of reference it's too vast again it's too not only vast in terms of quantity but um it's too dynamic to be collapsed into something right because it seems as if the moment we've collapsed it into some narrative some description it's it's literally too fast right for the for the for the for, for the narration <laughs> we're like narrating you know you say what's going on right now john and i like i give you a narrate narrative about it my, a description of it and it's already moved on to some other version of of itself right um experientially so so again you know the um experience will just constantly refute the narratives in that sense of deviate show us the ways in which it deviates from what we think it is and um you you mentioned you know the freedom and and for me the freedom is seeing that is liberating because in a sense we're liberated from all the seeming lack and limitation and restriction and identification that our language suggests it's really not none of that is actually there yeah yeah it's it's amazing this discovery is just amazing and you know what's really surprising is that this insight into the nature of our experience is just actually so accessible you know the way we talk about it it's in, in these terms can maybe make it seem like this is some kind of transcendent realm which is just so hard to mm -hmm. to even get you know but it's actually right here always accessible effortlessly and that's what i really like about your approach and and by the way if, if people maybe don't know your approach um you have a series on the uh, waking up app um, from sam harris which is great and um, there's also your website john and um your book um, is, is really great as well actually i have it right here really enjoying it and um so if people want to kind of explore your approach directly i, I highly encourage them to do but what i find really interesting about um your approach is is just how directly you point to it right and it's even kind of evident and just if you look at the length of these kind of guided explorations if you compare it to like a traditional meditation let's say <laughs> they're like 20 minutes half an hour but yours are maybe just four minutes five minutes and you just basically go right to it which is uh, fascinating and um I, I wonder how you kind of developed this or how you came to the conclusion that this is the way to go because um there's always i think no matter like how we teach this if you want to call it that how we convey this it's all it's a kind of reason in our experience of fear because in the way i convey this understanding to people um it's very evident to me that what i emphasize and what i don't emphasize is based on my own frustrations and, and challenges i had so i know from my own experience where i struggled where i was kind of latching on to something or seemingly couldn't progress and of course that comes across now and what i emphasize and what i don't emphasize so i'm curious about um, maybe what kind of the your experiences were or like these formative moments where you kind of eventually um came to this the style of of approaching mm. this if you want to call it that it's a really interesting question i actually had never really thought about that i did notice something um when i was writing the last book that you, you held up a moment ago which came out in a few years ago now that i was sort of curious and as i was writing the intro, intro to the book or the preface um i thought i would go i felt moved to go back to my earlier books the first one came out in 2005 i think and it was called too intimate for words now interestingly i i was kind of being influenced by by experiences that i had back then um 2001 or so and that was what prompted the writing of the book and i was talking a lot though about kind of awareness and um i was languaging things a little bit differently than i do now uh 
but they're right in the title was was essentially what what my most recent book is about that this is just too this is utterly beyond language um too intimate for words and then i went on and i wrote a couple of other books and when i went and looked back kind of i saw this thread running through all the books even though the way i talked about things and this emphasis on awareness you know was kind of there in these books and um, but but the thread running through all of them was and it, it sort of increased as the books went along was that no matter what i might say about this how i might try to dis talk about the nature of reality and in in, in in some of the ways that it seems to be talked about in traditions and structured in certain ways and um languaged it was like i kept running up against this thing and right and it was in the books that no matter what i might be saying this is just fundamentally inconceivable that that was this thread running through all of it and it just got stronger and stronger and stronger in a sense and 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 as a result i i felt like compelled to just emphasize that more in my sharing and talking to other people about it of course and again was reflected in my writing but i didn't really like if you look at the the previous book called searching for a rain in a monsoon like about half of the book sort of talks about kind of awareness is you know that um you know it's free of all the content you know as, as awareness teachings often sort of talk about it there's a space of awareness it's it's always here there's all this ever-changing content and very liberating thing to discover that and and then the other half of the book is like i have no idea what this is <laughs> it's just this is utterly inconceivable and indescribable won't be collapsed into language or concepts like that's the other kind of half of the book and but i was more just sort of saying that just notice that this is inconceivable this is indescribable right but i wasn't necessarily providing in that book any sort of ways to come to see that i was simply expressing that it was beyond conceptualization that it was it transcended language it transcended any sort of conceptual rendering and so i guess i'm, I'm just really literally thinking about this for the first time that that i found myself drawn because i'm interested in communicating about this i seem to be just compelled to communicate about it and share with other people out of my own really enthusiasm and joy and excitement um for just how astonishing this is and remarkable and freeing it is to to discover that and i guess the, the inquiries that sort of then evolved and then became you know a central part of the new the latest book really were like a a, a way that just i kind of happened upon to 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 help people to discover that, that this is inconceivable that this is transcends knowledge sense uh, essentially and and the simple you know essence of what i'm doing you know my work now is just having people explore their experience which of course is in a way easy to do because we always have it this is what we have is experience this is what we have to explore um we could say what seems to be happening and what seems to be being felt and heard and taste and touched and thought about and and just to explore experience itself and then discover how it's like the, the exploring experience will show us it, it is pretty obviously in our face the way in which it doesn't match our ideas about it basically I mean, one of the simplest ways that I that I'll often talk about, because it seems so obvious and it is in our face 24 seven, is that if we feel our experience right now, we can see that what's being felt is, um, we could say it's alive, you know, it's not static and fixed. It's not like we're feeling something and it's like holding still and being something that's sort of enduring over time, right? It's not like that. It's It's like, the current perception or the current feeling that's here is it's so dynamic right it's like a it's like a flame that's burning right and you say you know if you if you like an experience to like a, an alive fire you know it's alive it's it's not it's not holding still so you can't if you're looking at a fire burning in the fireplace and you were to say well Okay, I'm going to try to describe the shape of the fire. 
this is what it is. What's the pattern? <laughs> what pattern is that? <laughs> Let me describe that pattern, which is essentially what we're doing when we try to language and conceptualize our experience. We're saying, what, what, is it, what does it look like right now? What is it like? Right? We're, we're, what, it, what is it? <laughs> What's the definition of it? When you try to do that with a fire, well, like you can't do it, right? Because it's, it's changing in every flash instant. It's taking a different shape. Well, our experience, if we just feel experience, it's exactly like that, isn't it? It's not holding still. So that's how how long do you have to sit in meditation to realize that? You don't. It's it's right now, just see that, right? That it that it has no stability, no endurance. And right there is the refutation of all narratives. Because all the narratives are based on one thing having you know in relationship with something else or colliding with something else or dancing with something else or uh, interacting with something else you know the narratives of life right things engage with other things and just consensus reality but wait a minute all these things that i'm i'm telling a story about aren't things because they they're not static so they're alive so i cannot actually I literally cannot render in a, in a sense because of that I cannot know what anything is. I yeah. can't pin it down. So our experience so the, so the technique is just look at your experience and it will show you what it is and the way in which it transcends everything you think about it. Just in its simple presentation it transcends what you think it is yes and this insight is just absolutely liberating but you know at the same time um i acknowledge that it, it might be very counterintuitive for some people especially if they're kind of new to this kind of approach because if you just think about it how often in life are we usually rewarded for not finding the concrete answer not finding the right solution right it's, we're always supposed to know, we're always supposed mm -hmm. to have the answer, we always have to supposed to like a clear cut statement of what the truth is, right? Right. And here in this exploration, we never arrive at anything like concrete, solid and definable. But paradoxically, this is freedom because it is undefinable. This is satisfaction because it can never be grasped. But um, it, I, I also acknowledge that it, I can imagine for some people this might be a bit counterintuitive or challenging because of that. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. I mean, there seems to be a strong drive in us, right, of, of resolution, you know, of of what is this, knowing what this is, being able to determine things, what they are, and um and 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 in some ways as we live our lives you know as humans i mean some of that is 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 also like if i'm going to communicate to you about what's happening in my life and the story of my life and or the story of what just happened a moment ago and you're my friend and i want to share it with you let's say it's like there's a certain amount of woven into that whole dynamic is i'm talking about things as things that are happening right and in that there's already kind of some amount of sort of seeming conclusion about that otherwise what am i talking about right so it's very um and 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 as, and as humans, part of the, I think this desire for things to be a certain way that are, are can be pinned down is like, well, wait a minute, you just said that you can't determine what things are, and yet at the same time, language rests in a certain way very much upon the defining process and the determination process and and the drawing of conclusions about what things are. Otherwise. How could we even have a name for anything if we don't actually know what it is, right? So we've got, we're languaged creatures, right? We, we use language all the time. So it does seem as if we're talking about something when we have a conversation, right? 
And you tell me about what kind of work you do in the world. I tell you about my work. So what the hell are we talking about? <laughs> if if we actually can't fundamentally conclude what anything is, it's not actually, it doesn't resolve as being something definite. It, it how the hell, what's going on? You know, what is this world of a, a form that we seem to be embodied and living in and communicating about? I think it's just very, very paradoxical that both of those, in a sense, both of those realities are true, in a sense. They're both certainly experienced, we could say. Um, uh, I could say I'm having a, a kind of experience of, of, like, again, you know, of, of a conversation um, that's happening with another human being who lives in another part of the world from me and has his own life. And, right, I mean, all of that's there, in a sense. And we can talk about that and enjoy that to whatever extent we enjoy the forms, enjoy the way in which it seems to be. And then simultaneously, if we're so inclined <laughs> or it just happens to come into our life, you know, see it in this other way, which is, wow, it's, it's utterly indefinable and radically open-ended and unresolvable at the same time. I mean, that, that makes no sense logically, we could say. Yeah. And yet there's somehow some kind of exquisite logic to it to me at the same time where, uh, you know, the Buddhists would say it's the emptiness that dances as form, as a parent form. You know, it's an unpatterned, unresolvable infinity that shows up as something definite, finite, resolvable, right, recognizable. It really does show up like it doesn't show up as random, you know, ambiguity like snow on a television screen it shows up as patterned doesn't it i mean unbelievable patterning right exquisite patterning complex patterning like unbelievable so well which one is it is it finite and patterned or infinite and unpatterned ultimately well again the mind wants to have a conclusion about which one is it right and yeah. it just keeps going nope sorry it's in a sense it's both ways and also transcends both those ways at the same time <laughs> yeah yes that, that's such a great point because people sometimes seem to get frustrated because they want to access this transcendent realm so to say mm -hmm. and then they become frustrated because the world still appears the same way but what you are saying and what i totally agree is is that we can access the seemingly transcendent realm, the true nature of our experience, while also mm -hmm. fully acknowledging the fact that it appears as a world made out of objects. It's just that mm -hmm. there is no longer this felt belief that these are objects which exist in their own right as concrete, solid things. The way I, I like to use this analogy of the screen and the movie um, sometimes to bring this across because when you're let's say you're watching a movie on your tv screen mm -hmm. and uh, you can be totally involved in the movie right mm -hmm. but then somebody could also just say but you notice that all of that is just taking place on the screen right which right. is kind of the transcendent realm so to say so mm -hmm. you become aware of the screen but that doesn't mean that you stop seeing the movie right. the movie still kind of like takes its form takes its play and you can still see it so you can right. have both in a sense and in Absolutely. the same way you can be you can feel or sense into this transcendent aspect of our experience while also fully um become, uh, being aware of the kind of relative existence of it and therefore therefore also fully functioning within it absolutely you know and and you know makes me think of of um you know, I talk a lot about how this seems to be, how it seems to be appearing is all about perspective, right? And and how, so if we look at, I have a chapter in, in the book called The Impressionistic Nature of Experience, and I love this metaphor. And I, I talk about an impressionist painting, like a Monet, and even have a Monet on the cover of the book. And so, if we look at a painting, we're at a museum, you know, with Monet paintings, let's say, other Impressionist paintings, and we, we from one vantage point, we look at the image on the canvas, and it looks like something, doesn't it? Definitely looks like something, you know. 
uh, lilies on the pond. He painted a bunch of those. Monet did. So, so then, so from that vantage, there it is. There's the form. And we can appreciate the form and the beauty of the form. It's exquisite, right? I mean, we, we we love that. And then and then there you are. We're standing. We're in the museum together, and I I, I I'm pointing the paint. Isn't that just beautiful, Sam? And we're appreciating the beauty of the form on the canvas. And then one of us says, "But you know, that's not only what it is." And we're like, "What do you mean?" And, and you're like, "Well." come John let's go closer to the painting let's look a little more carefully at it like let's get into what it is so we 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 go up close to the painting and as we approach the painting we notice something that the structure that's there the forms that seem to be there the images that seem to be there start dissolving they start to become very ambiguous and eventually we discover it's like splashes of paint on a canvas right what there's absolutely unpatterned Literally, literally, you see no pattern whatsoever. It's just abstract. It's not. It's not structured. It's not formed. And so, oh my God, it's like this revelation that it's not what we thought it was. Right? That it's formless, it's without form. I mean, it's a perfect analogy in some ways to the exploration of experience. But then, we might want to step back again and appreciate the form. And we and we can go back and there's the forms and enjoy the forms, but we also know that that's not the whole story. <laughs> that it looks one way from one vantage and then from another vantage, it's not that at all. It's not that at all. It's it's wholly unresolvable, right? It's wholly unformed, and it's a bit like that, you know. Like I can look at this from the vantage of two people having a conversation. Like I'm looking at the Monet painting and appreciating the beauty of that and the exquisite nature of the, the seeming structure and form of it and um, operating within that kind of frame of reference. And then I can take a step back, if you will, or a step into and feel this thing that I'm calling, this event like that I'm calling a conversation, that I've collapsed into this um seeming definition where i've kind of set the limits and the boundaries of what it is it's a conversation as compared to something else it's not a conversation so i've defined the scope of it in a sense but if we feel like even if we do this now we feel well what is a conversation it's like going up to the painting what is what are the what is there what is that form i feel the conversation as what is this that i'm in other words, I'm interpreting it as a conversation. What is it that I'm interpreting? What's actually here? Because interpretation is a concept. It's an abstraction. I mean, calling it a conversation is an abstraction. What, what, is, what is here? <laughs> what is actually being encountered? Does, it, it, you're immediately in a way you're immediately in the free fall of i mean i could take pieces of it and say well part of the conversation is sound <laughs> it's happening okay what's sound that's an interpretation too what is sound there's i i i, I can't it's like it's like I say it's like a receding horizon. Like I try to move towards it and it moves away from me. I can't I can't gra get grasp it. I can't grasp hold of it. it just keeps slipping away from me. Um, and that's just the sound aspect. What about what about the meaning of words? Like what what is that? <laughs> that is part of the conversation. What is meaning? You know what is the experience of meaning? You see, it's like it's just utterly beyond beyond the beyond the beyond what it actually is <laughs> and every piece as we start to deconstruct it in a sense in, by by exploring our experience and we say we, we might identify it, oh well it's this and then we explore that and it's like well, what's that and then it's that's made of whatever that's made of and you just keep <laughs> unpacking it in a sense and you're you, you never get to the you were talking about like that part of us that wants to have a conclusion about what it is 
and if we look at our experience we just never come to a final conclusion we, we never arrive at a final conclusion eureka <laughs> i got to the bottom of what it is right <laughs> yeah. yeah you know one thing that comes up quite naturally for me and um it's not just out of my out of my own interest but also because i i convey this to other people is mm -hmm. well what's what's the cause of this mm. seemingly felt sense of separation because of course people hear us talking about this and they they might feel like well it sounds great and all but i actually want to experience this you know i don't just want this to be a yeah. nice kind of idea you know and then of course naturally the the question for me at least arises of well if that's the case if actually our experience the essence of it is totally undefinable open-ended and free well why does it seem like that's not the case you know and, and um so i the way i usually just briefly how I, i how i usually convey this is that there is a specific kind of activity of the mind which seems to create this illusion of really being a, a separate self a separate entity among other concrete objects and um, what we can mm -hmm. say about this like re reality about the flow of experience is of course that first of all it's dynamic right it's always changing it's like a shapeshifter you called it which i think is, mm -hmm. is great and sometimes of course um this this presence if you want to call it that seems to kind of veil itself it seems to become something other than just presence in the form of these objects right and and how this is felt from the perspective of our body minds is by way of attending to things right so things can seemingly come into focus right and that is in a sense already a kind of veiling maybe of the the presence of it even though essentially it never is because it's not like something gets created outside of presence right but but then to me what's actually and how i convey this to people is that what then really seems to create or reinforce the sense of not just a kind of veiling but also being a localized separate entity is a kind of grasping a fixation onto the seeming object right we we seem to grasp onto an object of our experience and that can be something in the outside world or something within seemingly our body and that creates then a kind of sense of being a localized and contracted entity you know which is uh, kind of deep and held and, and in a sense unconscious and um yeah so so then what mm. goes along with that is that what I kind of the primary instruction I give to people to to get in touch first with this kind of experiential reality of this mm -hmm. is to relax that grasping you know open up and relax into what's already so and then it naturally becomes obvious and well before i go further mm -hmm. into that that's just kind of my take on that yeah or, yeah how, how you explain that and um yes mm. how you kind of like get people to um get people in it touch seems, with seems, experiential yeah, reality it seems like my it's funny because this came up in a conversation i was doing a session with someone yesterday about this they ask a similar question and I mean, I think that as a, that that can be a strategy in a sense of like relaxing the grasping. But as you were talking about that as a mechanism, you know, there's some kind of grasping that seems to create a sense of separation. Um, and I was just kind of feeling into, well, what is that exactly? What is grasping? What, what would that be? What are, What is being grasped or attempted to grasp hold of? And I wondered if, you know, to my earlier comment about the dynamism of this, we could say one way to understand the grasping is sort of an effort to kind of hold it in place in a sense absolutely so, yeah. so, so that i can actually render it so that i can know it so that i can understand it because <laughs> there i am I'm, i'm looking at the fire and it's like how can i understand what that is when it's something different every flash instant so then i might think well if i could just sort of hold it in place like freeze it long enough grasp hold of it long enough that i can then look at it and, and say there's a shape and define it maybe that's an element of the grasping is to try to 
keep this from shape shifting in a sense. Um, yeah. But so, so one approach would be to say, okay, so relax the grasping. Another approach, which I think is the way I tend to kind of proceed with this stuff uh, most of the time is, okay, again, let's go and look at reality itself. And because what reality is going to show us, if we just look with curiosity and openness, is that it is not graspable, that its nature is. So we could try to stop grasping, or we could just see that grasping isn't even possible. <laughs> because reality yes. will not be held in place. It will, its very nature, it's just like letting go, right? Like we could hear teachings talk about like we'll let go you know or it's kind of a bit similar has a dissimilar feel to, to relax the grasping but just you know yeah. relax like let go but it's like <laughs> what's reality doing its very nature is ungrasping or letting go we could say in the sense of it it's lets go of its form it never really it's so radical that it never even becomes anything in a sense so it's that's how radical the letting go is the dissolving so the very the very appearing of this moment i mean literally not philosophically the very what we might call the appearance of this instant is literally it's it's disappearance it's right, going yeah. away as it's, it's like the train I just in this new series I did on the Sam Harris waking up app, it's about the exploration of the nature of the moment of of now. It's called the nature of now. And I, I in one of those meditations, I, I I use the image of I'm exploring this very question about how long is this here for, basically. And I and this image just came to me of like a, a train that's that you're standing on the tracks and the train's approaching you, let's say, and it's coming, it's coming, it's approaching, it's approaching. And is there a moment where the train, if the train is move, in other, in other words, if the train's dynamic and it doesn't stop like reality um, or, or the moment, what we call the moment, it's, it's approaching and then it finally arrives at you, it doesn't stop there, right? It continues moving. So does it actually ever arrive? Does the moment ever arrive? Does the train of now ever arrive? Or is its arrival literally like a train that's moving on the tracks we we would say again it's not philosophy is it it's like the arrival of the train is the departure of the train which one is it is a train leaving or coming or going <laughs> is, is this moment coming or is it going well that way of talking about it only makes sense if there's a moment where it comes it stops and then it goes but if there's no if it's a continuum with no stopping point, which it is, would seem, because life doesn't stop, then it never actually arrives. So why am I saying this? Well, coming back to your point about grasping and relaxing the grasping, it's like, again, look at reality. It's like, it is ungraspable because it's gone as soon as it appears, literally as soon as it appears. So whatever we think we're even grasping, because actually it's conceptual. The idea that we could even grasp is a concept. The grasping actually can't happen. <laughs> even though yeah. we can talk about it like a thing that's happening and then a thing we could re relax from happening in a sense. But grasping is not possible be in, in, in terms of the nature of reality because everything is vanishing. <laughs> it's just gone. And so for me, seeing that is um, cuts through, again, the, the sense that, I mean, all the, all the, everything falls away in a sense, like all the ways of formulating anything, including separation or no separation, or it's like, it's literally just, <laughs> it's all, it all, it transcends, the transcendence is, yeah does that make sense it's like it's it's yeah, it's, yes uh, yes yeah yeah it's absolutely it's, um, you know yeah no, go ahead yeah it's, it's it's absolutely true that um I, I totally agree with you and and usually how if, if i had to like sum up kind of like my approach to conveying this i would describe mm -hmm. it as um relax and explore so mm -hmm. first of all like this relaxation is kind of like 
foundational for me but the thing to really explore and to realize is that that which you really are in your essence whatever that is right it seems like i'm turning it into an object but of course it isn't that yeah. already is full fully free that is like fully relaxed so by so the best you as a seeming person can do if you're really convinced that you are is kind of relax in order so that it becomes obvious but the realization then is that this already is so without any effort whatsoever this right. is just the very nature of experience and as a matter of fact you mm. you can't even get out of that right there, there is you have this this beautiful song it's called no escape right mm -hmm. and uh, where you kind of like convey this idea that you actually can never leave this right so this is right. like just kind of an instruction I give to somebody who is seemingly very, very, like very much believes that he is a real concrete entity mm. in, in a separate world to then kind of like get in touch seemingly with that, which is already so. And then my experience is that you can build a kind of confidence, but not the confidence of the, the body mind that you can now do something or or uh, you now have mastered a technique but a kind of confidence that this is always so and then mm -hmm. you can just let go seemingly what's the best on the level of the body mind that's kind of the best you can do but let go into the realization that this is already the nature of experience and and that's mm -hmm. why your why your kind of approach like resonated with me so much because it fits so so well into that into this realization that well, everything is this, everything is ungraspable. This is just the nature of reality. And furthermore, you know, and a lot of times it's just emphasized that true nature, like this kind of presence is ungraspable. But what you really point to is that even when it seems to turn into, into like something more concrete and solid, that still is just as un undefinable if we actually um, it, go it, to that experience. Yes, absolutely. And not only that, Sam, but what's really fascinating and, and I don't know, just to me, beautiful in some kind of way, aesthetically, is that, and you, you started off our conversation talking about, you know, we hear these words like transcend and it sounds very like something other than what's here now, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. But it's actually the complete opposite in this sense, which is the, 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 the formless, unstructured, transcendental, you know, um, diaphanous nature of of this is actually found not by gut because because this feels really substantial and concrete and fixed in form doesn't it like it has this like i can feel this is concrete i can feel this right what do you mean unstructured unformed so we hear something like well no no it transcends the form it's like i gotta go somewhere other than the form to find it right and it's actually the opposite that because to do that, we literally have to go to something that's not here. Like we hear it as an idea, the transcendent, the unformed, the formless. Like I'm going to go find that somewhere, but that's an abstract search. No, yeah. the trick is to go to what seems to be here concretely. What What's being felt concretely? Like, in other words, it's a, as my friend Peter Brown, who, who was, a, was a wonderful mentor of mine, passed away recently. He, 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 a favorite term of his was the actuality, you know, like to what's actually mm -hmm. here, concretely here is how I, I speak about it. Like, so if you feel, I mean, you take anything like that feels to be here, like concretely, like, um, and I mean, take, take something that, that seems obviously concretely here, or there's a felt sense of it, which is the body, right? So, like what we are absolutely transcends that the body is a, is a, is actually an abstraction. So, but there's something concretely here that then gets defined in an abstract way as a body. So feel what we call the body, like whatever that signifier is signifying. In other words, what, what is the word referring to? Okay. So there's a presence of something concretely here, right? So feel that what's concretely here. And keep feeling what's concretely here, not your ideas about it, but what's concretely here, what's actually here. And keep feeling that. And what is that? No, not as an intellectual question, but 
feel feel your way into the answer of what is it that's concretely here and this very curious thing will become apparent will be discovered which is that which is concrete cannot be found and yet it's concrete it's here what feels like it's here go to look for it go to identify it you know there it is i've identified what that concrete thing is and you will not be able to do it you will not be able to even though and yet it doesn't stop being concretely here it's just the ultimate just like you're saying earlier you know that the the seeing that the the movie playing on your television set is just a light show you know just pixels doesn't stop the appearance from happening so that sense of the concrete presence of what i call body it's like it's here it's just it's here but it's not here it's concrete but it's empty of findability empty of identifiability and and again that is literally what we're feeling we're feeling the unfindability we're feeling the unresolvability if that makes sense it's yeah it's um it's the opposite of abstraction yes. feeling what's palpably here and present you know feel the presence of your experience and it's it's absolutely present and absolutely indeterminate as to what what it is where it is how it is anything about it is not resolvable and yet here it is yeah i, I really like the pointer to or this kind of instruction to feel I, it wasn't something i really used and kind of like and how i convey this but i kind of experimented with it and and what struck me and and why it's so why it seemed very effective to me is that a lot of times like we use terms of kind of like recognize or see something right and that already mm -hmm. kind of implies a sort of distance right there here mm -hmm. i am and here is this object and i'm not sure if that is your intention behind it but when you say feel you know when we feel something it's immediate it is right here it is closer yeah. than close i mean how how far do we have to go to feel something it is here already totally present exactly. intimate so i'm not quite yeah. sure if that was your intention behind that no it it really it, yeah uh, there's something about that word that to me is um I, I wrote a, a song not too long ago that kind of speaks to that. It says, you know, he, here we are feeling everything. Everything's being felt. Yes. And, and, that, and even what's... That's the presence of it. Everything's being felt. Yeah. And, yes. And that includes the seeing. Every sense perception, right, is being felt, right? Exactly. And you can actually really realize this in your experience and invite anyone who's watching to do this right now. You can if you just, first of all, maybe relax a bit and, and just take in the entirety of what you're seeing right and mm -hmm. maybe then just relax back even a little bit more and see that you're not seeing a room but that there's just seeing it might be appearing as a room mm -hmm. but actually there's just the seeing of it mm -hmm. and the seeing how far away is it from you do you see at a distance or do you feel the seeing with absolute immediacy with no distance whatsoever mm -hmm. and this can become quite obvious yeah no ab absolutely yeah yeah i actually wrote another song that 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 speaks exactly what you're saying it's called closer than that and um i was looking out over i was actually in brazil at the time and, and i was looking out over this lake where i was staying and i was like you know as you gaze upon the um the clouds floating in the sky tell me are they really out there or are they closer than that? Yeah, where, where is it? Where is like you're looking at me, and and the sense sort of the conventional reality notion is that I'm, I'm other than you. I'm over there, for you, and you're here, right? And or for for me, you're over there, and I'm here, and that's that sense of the subject object, the sense of spatiality, right? So. Now my experience of the supposed otherness that's over there, spatially speaking, at a distance from me, the experience is is 
here. Yes. It's, it's absolute intimacy. So so what I call there, the, there's no here and there. There's, yes. there's literally, and, and similarly, the, the, the notion of that there's an inside and the inside is here and the outside is over there, right? So this is why feeling experience is so powerful. So if you feel experience, which you are feeling, you feel the presence of, let's say, the presence of the moment, if the flow of experiencing and it's all its diversity, and you just feel this flow and it's showing up as all sorts of things, but you just feel the flow of experience. It's like inside, outside, <laughs> what do you mean? It's, it's, it's absolutely beyond space, isn't it? It it's, transcends the notion of space. There's no, that's the no escape, you know, that you referred to. It's like, you, you, you can't get outside of, in other words, in experience, there's no outside, is there? There's just experience. <laughs> so wherever you travel in the field of experience, it's just, you're feeling experience. And the notion of inside and outside is like, inside, outside of what? <laughs> there's just this. And it has no inside or outside. Mm -hmm. It's all intimately yeah. closer than close, you know. Yogananda, who was my, my first spiritual influence, he, he used to, you know, had this poem that he would recite, made a chant out of it, you know. God is nearer than nearer, the nearest of the near, you know. It's like nearer than near. I was like, what, what? I never really knew what that meant. <laughs> but yeah. it sounded it sounded good at the time, but it's like nearer than near. It's like there's no space. That's how near it is. <laughs> it's not like something that's far away and then comes closer. It's just bam. It's just here. It's just here. There's yeah. no 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 um, distance, zero distance between anything. Yes, yes, and it's actually totally obvious, right? If we just only open up to this, it's not it's not hard to. It might sound abstract, but again, in your actual experience, this is just more obvious than anything could ever be. And uh, but you know, nevertheless, I, I come back to this point because, as I said, you know, I my concern is always like how approachable is this for, yeah, let's say like people Average who this person, is completely yeah. yes, yeah. yes. You know, it's like I I don't really differentiate between like people who who like approach this more directly or don't you know because mm -hmm. i think part of this realization is that you realize that the essence of everything is not different everything is this indefinable essence and therefore um differentiating between like i don't know spiritual people or not spiritual people is just an absolute idiocy and <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. a completely wrong way to go about it but nevertheless we can acknowledge of course that um this might may or may not be more approachable for people who who like are more involved with this with this kind of like um way of of exploring their reality and and something you know usually the way i go about this if i want to kind of introduce people to this um this this actuality of their experience right mm -hmm. is that i tend to first kind of emphasize this presence we're talking about right this sheer fact of um kind of existence that something is here we don't know what it is but we can discover that nevertheless it is here even though it's totally undefinable um and mm -hmm. that you know that that's usually how i go about it because i i tend to you know in talking to people a lot of times their attention is so graspy and so entangled with the seeming world that it seems hard for them to kind of experientially yeah. go into these seeming phenomena so that's why right. i kind of emphasize this but at the same time I, I fully acknowledge because i've 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 kind of seemingly gotten stuck there in the past that mm -hmm. it's very easy to turn this into a kind of object to reify it or to think that presence mm -hmm. is some kind of state distinct mm -hmm. from object so i i really kind of emphasize all the way through that there is no any separation. This is the presence. Presence is right. what is taking the shape of this very experience. But nevertheless, yeah. I do kind of put this emphasis there first. And I wonder if you don't even find that necessary. I kind of get the sense that you don't. And and you actually told me that you share this this with your like students, psychology students mm -hmm. at university yeah. um, who don't have a background in this. So I wonder mm -hmm. like how are your experiences with that? 
Uh, actually, uh, what you're describing, sort of, you know, kind of recognizing the presence of, of each experience, you know, as almost like a fundamental aspect of it, in a sense. Um, I very much actually utilize that sort of as a, a kind of a strategy of sorts. Um, but but do, because, you, do you do that first, yeah. I wonder? Like, is that what you do first? Um, I, I use it as, uh, I mean, essentially, I, I'm, I'm trying to help people to reorient because our, our, our habit of is we're orienting to the descriptions, basically. And that's what we think is real. All my ideas of what's going on here, right? That's what we're orienting to. That's a table. That's a chair. This is sorrow. This is joy. We're orienting to what we think things are, to the descriptions. So how it seems to be based on those descriptions. So and out of all that describing, and, and, I, and I put this in a psychology context when I'm especially, well, no, all the time, really. Um, in, in a way, I just put it in a human context, but I could say a psychology context in terms of my psychology graduate students. But what orienting to the descriptions seems to create also, because as part of the describing and interpreting is the creation of a kind of, of a hierarchy of, of the experience, right? Like this is better than that. This is more meaningful than that. This is more valuable than that. This is closer to, the the well-being that i'm seeking or the freedom that i'm seeking or the peace of mind that i'm seeking whatever we seek right so so this orientation to to merely to the the way see, things seem to be based on our descriptions just keeps us on this kind of hamster wheel when it comes to finding some sort of stable if you will well-being or ease or whatever it is the human searching for happiness because sometimes if the way we're describing it is like matches what we think this is well-being and then this experience well that's not or this is in a spiritual context this is god or this is freedom and enlightenment and that's not again it's all being driven by the the orienting to the descriptions right so by having people experiment with reorienting to just the sheer presence of whatever we've described we're 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 kind of it, it's help it helps people to um we're like kind of people are, are are being invited in that kind of exploration to move from what they think it is based on the descriptions to just the sheer fact of its existence in a sense right which is of course undeniable because like right now there's something here i could call it a conversation on a computer yeah. again but what's most fundamental about that description of the event called a, a zoom conversation or, or a, in this case i guess uh we're using a different platform not zoom but um <laughs> but uh um we could say it's you know the buddhists would say the suchness of it right the ex the isness of it the existence of it or you could say the presence for me those are all synonyms in a sense that are getting at this basic the fact of of it the facticity of it the the actuality of it the the the, the um presence is a wonderful word and i use it all the time the presence of it yeah now as you said before we have a tendency to think even like in spiritual circles like presence is a kind of a state and i'm going to become if i practice enough i can become more present and then it, presence can go away and and i say well that's fine i mean as far as it goes but the presence that i'm interested in the presence that i'm talking about is the presence that never comes and goes that is the presence of what is that never comes and goes does it that's always here yes the existence of the moment it's always changing but paradoxically always here always here and and so we're essentially reorienting to to something that is as i say the common denominator of everything you know that that is fundamental to everything so we could say again what's fundamental to all of this apparent diversity that often leads me on this search for you know i've got to i've got to rearrange my life and circumstances in such a way sort it all out so that i can have just the right set of experiences and circumstances in order to relax to be okay to feel well right and this is the ordinary sort of mode it's like well what if that there's what if there's an alternative which is we can find something about all of this that is 
a kind of what I call another order of well-being altogether that doesn't come and go and isn't dependent upon or conditioned by the way things appear to be. And I sometimes call that just a play on words, the, the well of being itself, you know, the beingness of everything, the existence of everything. So that reorientation that you were describing, essentially from reorienting from the descriptions, the interpretations, the conceptualizations, to just the sheer fact of presence, the presence of what is, is very, very powerful. And it, it, it cuts through, it can really cut through the, the, the well-worn habit of believing that this is merely what I'm thinking it is, essentially, and getting much more to the kind of the root of it, which is its its presence, its existence, its its beingness, essentially. Yeah. Yes, and you hit another point there, which I really wanted to get into as well. And well, we can kind of acknowledge that I think most of the people who get interested in these kinds of topics or like spirituality broadly, if you want to call it that, yeah. do so because they seem to suffer to an extent which is not well which is too much for them right it's unbearable to, to them in a degree and and that's very much how i approach this i always had a kind of just intellectual interest in it or a philosophical interest as well but to mm -hmm. me i was also just suffering in in very awkward and neurotic ways and excessive ways where i knew that um Mm -hmm. There must be, I had this intuition that there must be something else to this. There must be a different way of, to use your words, orienting to, to my experience, right? Yeah. And that, of course, brings up the question of um, how, how does this relate to this kind of ordinary messiness? Because we are, of course, not advocating that whenever you encounter a challenging situation in your life, well, you don't always have the luxury of kind of taking your time and, and just going into it. A lot of times, I guess you do, right? But still, circumstances can be kind of difficult. And and mm -hmm. so we're both, I think, not advocating that you're supposed to try to like make every day of your life, your life a kind of spiritual inquiry. But nevertheless, there is this power, at least in my view, of this understanding, if we want to call it that, to completely transform the way we experience this from the perspective of, of the body-mind. And I wonder yeah. how, you, how you see this, how you see like the accessibility of this as well. Um, is it just something, just to kind of throw an idea out there, is it just something you do, like these explorations, and, and then you kind of leave it at that, and that has a kind of, effect naturally on how you go about life as is, is it a kind of like ticking time warp that just transforms your body from within um through like after a while or mm -hmm. is it something you continuously go back to in your life um even throughout your day how do you just see this whole project yeah i think it's a, for me it, it's been a mix of both in the sense that you know if we go back to the impressionist painting metaphor and say well and, and let's say what we're looking at, you know, metaphorically speaking, is a really difficult, something very difficult that we're encountering that we might call a kind of suffering of some kind. And that, that's, that's the form rather than a beautiful Monet painting. But what looks to be formed and patterned and showing up is whatever, fear, anxiety, insecurity, whatever, difficulty, grief. And so, honestly, I would say at this point in time, planet Earth, it would seem that's mostly what the only reality that people seem to kind of be aware of, that this the seemingly described reality, right? That we really what what psychologists call cognitive fusion, which is a term I talk a lot about in my classes because it's being talked about in psychology now, particularly in the a, a psychotherapy method called acceptance commitment therapy, which is kind of a cornerstone of it, is 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 learning to defuse from cognitions. And essentially, what that means, it's actually really what my work is about. Although I'm not really sure, ACT as it's called, that that therapeutic approach really takes it all the way to to where I'm pointing people to. But but essentially, the notion of fusion is that something is here and then there's sort of a rendering of it a conceptualization of it of a mapping of it of some kind like this is what it is and fusion is actually 
equating the two, smearing the two together, where we, we literally think reality is what we think it is. Like, I literally think that I'm having a conversation on a computer. There's no, and, and so for the most part, people are, are fused with their cognitions, with their interpretations, without even realizing it. Defusion is discovering that our interpretations are just interpretations. They're not reality. That's diffusion. So how so so let's say we'll come back to the, the painting metaphor again and, and, and this time the painting, so to speak, is something very difficult that's happening. And there's this sense of this is the only way we know it as this thing, this stress or this anxiety. And it feels like this fixed thing. It feels like it's threatening somehow to me. It's overwhelming me. And I, of course, am also sort of defined it through existence as the subject of this event. And so this is how it's framed typically. And I have got to do something to overcome it. And then if maybe we've been introduced to another way to explore experience and discover something else about it, like in other words, someone came up to us and said, hey, let's take a step up towards the painting, get close to it, and we'll discover, hmm, wow, suddenly all that seeming solidity and um, definability starts to, to become called, be called into question, right? Because we're, we're starting to see what it's made of, a sense, which is, can't really be said, ultimately. And so, so then let's say you get introduced to that let's say i'm introducing my graduate students and it's like i'm inviting them to explore their experience to discover it's not to de defuse from what they think it is essentially and <clears throat> now depending on how that goes what can ha sometimes happen maybe not infrequently is that the compelling nature or the habitual nature of the interpretations or the convincing nature of them is such that it can seem to be difficult to, it's almost like they just keep seeing it as the painting, as the object that they think it is. And, um, you know, it's one of those things that's sort of basic, like confirmation bias kind of thing. If you think, if you're pretty convinced that it is the way you think it is, even when presented with evidence to the contrary, there can be a kind of an investment in that point of view, right? And, I think that's part of maybe the mechanics of why it can be difficult because, man, it sure does seem like it's something. It sure does seem like that's a table. And then the quantum physicist comes along and says, well, that's not the whole story. It's this dance of quantum. What? And you're like, screw that. It's a table. Don't tell me it's something else. It's a little bit like that, isn't it? It's really compellingly, it seems to be the way we think it is really strongly, right? So in any case, if somebody is either open enough, curious enough about it, who knows how really the mechanics of, of, of being able to glimpse its indefinable, unstructured, if you will, transcendental nature of experience, and they see that, now they've been introduced to this other perspective. Like they, they got up close to the painting and they realized, and maybe, maybe in the next moment they're thrust right back and it's like it lo all looks definable. But now they've had this glimpse, they've, they've seen this other possibility, this other way to hold the experience or to see it or to encounter it. And I think that enough of, of this kind of exploration can start to become, almost becomes kind of a bit second, na second nature in terms of, well, actually, there you are, you're in the throes of some difficulty based on how you're defining the experience. And, but there's a kind of simultaneous knowing that that's not merely the, what it is, that it transcends that. And, and you know that in an embodied kind of way, you know that instinctively, not just conceptually, you know it. You can feel the way in which it transcends. You have a kind of experiential access to that other perspective. It's not conceptual, right? Um, so I, can, I think it can be both something that just becomes more and more there as a simultaneous kind of understanding and also something that one can intentionally like i i did this not long ago i was in a, a traffic jam and uh it was really quite a traffic jam i was trying to get back home from los angeles and it was like a six hour drive and this was delaying my drive like by probably a couple of hours it was that massive a traffic jam and so i found myself 
becoming what I might describe as irritated <laughs> by what was happening. And I just, of course, just because I, I don't know, just I am the way I am now. I'm like kind of curious, like I'm recognizing the painting, the structure form of this thing called irritability. There it is. There's no denying of it. There it is. Like I'm irritated. I'm frustrated. Oh, what is that? So then I became sort of curious in a kind of intentional way, like, oh, what is irritation? And literally like in one flash instant, I was like, Ir irritation is this it, absolute transcendental infinity that can't be described. It's really, it's that as well. And and it doesn't always work this way, but like in that moment of seeing that the irritation was like, went up in a puff of smoke, it was like gone. I couldn't even find the irritation. And then it felt like it was there again in a sense, but simultaneously there was a sense of like, what is it actually? It's it's the radiance of infinity. You know, it's, it's this indescribability. It, it's just, it's God, <laughs> literally. I mean, it's the divine to, to put it in those terms. So, all I can say is that one can just be irrita irritated. You know, you don't need to inquire into what it is more fundamentally. But that inquiry, at least in my life, kind of results in, it kind of has a pretty big payoff, I would say. And the payoff is less suffering of those kinds of moments that I might typically think of as uncomfortable or problematic or just not a lot of fun or maybe very painful potentially so less suffering to see what it is more fundamentally it's transcendental kind of infinite unresolvable nature it's diaphanous nature and also less suffering more enjoyment because it's like it was almost like i could enjoy the irritation in a way it wasn't a problem it wasn't the irritation wasn't irritating <laughs> the the discomfort wasn't it was like, what do they say? You know, finding the comfort in the discomfort in a way, finding the ease and the unease. It's like it's right there in the very heart of our most afflictive states of mind is this profound equanimity, this profound. What does it say in the Bible? You know, the peace that passeth understanding. Yes. And it's the yes. peace that is transcends all of our understanding. So in a sense, the exploration I was describing around the irritability was, was discovering yet again and again and again and again, it seems to my life, that I don't know what this is. I don't know what irritability is, actually. On the one hand, I know what it is and I have a name for it. On the other hand, I have no idea what it is. I cannot get to the bottom of it. I cannot find it. I cannot identify it. I cannot determine it. And, and somehow the seeing of that is peace. It's the peace that passeth all understanding. It's 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 because there's no conflict there. There's nothing to be in conflict with. There's no things, right? That's why we would say it's peaceful. It's 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 at ease because there's not one thing pushing against another. There's no things. There's just a call it a seamless flow of experiencing that doesn't actually ever really become anything definite even though it definitely looks like it does yeah. <laughs> which is the great paradox <laughs> yes yes and life really does provide us with so many opportunities to go on to these kinds of explorations and but what i think what's really important is to have maybe relatively speaking to have the right kind of attitude about it because it's of course possible to kind of approach this with an attitude of, I'm not doing this to get rid of my suffering, right? But a much more um, effective, or let's just, let's just say truthful exploration is to just see how it is. You're not trying yeah. to produce anything. You're not trying to get anywhere. You're not trying to get rid of anything. You're just seeing, so to say, or feeling the reality of it. And that just, very commonly it has the side effect of bringing this this perfume of peace to the foreground just naturally without really having to do anything just because that is um how true nature is and that is really always um accessible and 
yeah, it's it's really just so simple to do. You know? And this this kind of like relaxation into um this obviousness of the recognition, that is really something I emphasize because um it's just so easy and instantaneous to do like like a glimpse, so to speak. So no matter how overwhelming your life circumstances seem to be, it's just so easy to relax into this undefinable openness like that, you know, and that that is something I encourage people if they get caught up in, in these fixations to do. And mm -hmm. and then apart from that, life just even throughout your day, there are so many moments where you can just explore your experiential reality of what you are and and really do it with a kind of you could even say just passion right just an interest you know oh i wonder you know i wonder what this is you know and then just just naturally right we we find the well the the truth of it with just at the same time totally indefinable and free yeah that's beautifully said yeah that's the the counterintuitive sort of truth in a sense which is that the if you will, the solution lies in the apparent problem, not outside of it, you know, that the yeah. the freedom, you know, there you are, you're feeling constricted and bound and identified. And then you hear all these things about becoming free of the constriction and identification and bondage, you know, to find the freedom. And, and, and it's easy to hear, like, I've got to go somewhere else to find the freedom, right? It's not, but it's actually in what we call bondage. Because, because bondage is freedom. Bondage is the freedom that is the transcendent, unresolvable freedom. Because bondage, I mean, in a sense, we could say freedom is a discovery that bondage doesn't actually exist. It's not what we actually imagine it to be. But So we find the freedom by just entering into whatever's here, including bondage, including disappointment, including heartbreak, including the things we might imagine are not the freedom and we've got to go somewhere else to find freedom from those it's actually we could say they are made of the freedom everything yes. is made of that freedom and so the doorway is everything is the doorway into that freedom everything is the doorway yes it's it's in the heart of experience not apart it's from in the it. heart of experience exactly not apart from it it's it's presenting as the freedom presents as you know, the inf infinite presents as everything. So each of our experiences are are actually it. And, and that's the great liberation because you're never apart from it. No experience pulls you away from the ground of being because every experience is an expression of the ground. Of course it is. Everything is an expression of life, of existence, of reality, whatever you want to call it. And so we're never, our freedom is unconditioned in that sense by you know just as the ocean is and its existence and its vitality doesn't depend upon the particular waves it's producing right it remains itself no matter how it looks so freedom whatever you want to call this this transcendental freedom remains itself in all of its appearances it never departs from itself never becomes anything other than itself and so we don't have to go somewhere else. We don't have to go. This is this is the sort of tricky aspect of practice, you know, in a spiritual context, right? To do the practice in such a way to not go somewhere else, to get to some greener grass, some better state, some more enlightened, awakened state, but to just stay put, you know, if you will, you know, right, right where you are is it. You can't, of course, you can't. Be any other place than the place that you are so there's no escape yeah. as we were saying so it's more like maybe that's where the relaxation comes in it's like i'm gonna what i'm relaxing is the effort to get somewhere else <laughs> ultimately exactly exactly <laughs> relaxing into what's already so and and yeah. whoever wherever you are whoever is listening to this we're really talking about this experience this experience right here and right now and talking about it so much again that is the downside even though it's so enjoyable to talk about it i suppose the downside could be that it seems like it's something other than this but this is already it you don't That's need right. to look for anything else and the experiential reality of it is just it's not even in the same realm you know i i you can't really approach it with words and when you get in touch with that 
that is really all the nourishment that is all the freedom that is all like freshness you are looking for right here right now exactly where you are exactly in this beautifully said i think that's a beautiful note for us to maybe come to a end of our yes, wonderful right. conversation. Yes, so running out of yeah. time, yeah, but uh, <laughs> it's been absolutely great talking with you, John. I, I really enjoyed this, and I will put all the links to, to your work in the video description as well. If people want to check that, check that out, and I highly recommend that they do. Sam, it's just a complete pleasure uh, having met you and um, getting to, to talk about these things that we ultimately can't talk about when we talk about a paradox, right? But somehow, it's so enjoyable to speak about it anyway. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, feel the exact same way, John. Yeah, well, so yeah. have a great day and uh, hope we can do this again soon. Yes, thanks so much, Sam. Take good care. Okay, bye-bye.